Hello, it's uh, great to be here. I get to talk about something that I enjoy probably most in life, maybe next to dancing, but I still enjoy it a lot. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, Nordic LARP, and why I say Nordic LARP and not just LARP, it's that this is the this is the sort of the part of LARP that I am used to, and. Uh, Nordic LARP also differs from LARP in other parts of the world. Uh, I will talk a bit about that maybe later, but that's just uh, the culture of LARP in Nordic countries has grown into being sort of sometimes more avant garde and like it's sort of different than in many parts of the world. That's why, like, in how do you say Czechoslovakia, it's not called Czech. Okay. Czech Republic. Czech Republic, thanks. Uh, always get that wrong. Uh, in Czech Republic, for example, they say that they now do Nordic LARP. Nordic style LARP. Uh, because sort of they have maybe the most interestingly growing scene right now. Uh, the way we maybe see it. And there's no right and wrong here, but it's different approaches to this hobby. Uh, so, just briefly about this guy here. So this is the first year I'm LARPing. This is uh, sort of 11 years ago, I think, 2001. In the fall, it's not from the f my first game, it's from my, I think it's from my the second game. Classic Swedish fantasy game, sort of where LARP comes from. This is outside of Westeros. And we had the, sort of the dark elves, and that was sort of a wood elf thing here, and after the LARP, there's always, almost always, a big meetup. Everyone meet at the village and talk about, yeah, it was so nice killing you. <laughs> um, so sort of, that was, that was my first entry point to this hobby. And now, I work with uh, live, but not uh, LARP. <laughs> I work with live video. Uh, I also work with LARP. But my full-time job is I sort of sit here and produce uh, where Bjorn is sitting now, produce a uh, live video, uh, or I stand with the camera, or I produce other kind of online video. So that's just that's just me, um, and uh, I will happy. I will be really happy since you're going to do different kinds of working with cross media. Would love to talk to you about how to work with mobile video, how to work with live streamed video, and uh, how to like produce really, really, really good movies with an iPhone. But I will do that sometimes else, maybe afterwards, not in this lecture. Um, so, instead, to know what LARP is, the, the only really good way to know what LARP is, um, you need to try it. So right now, we're going to do that. <laughs> so. I will sort of really start to talk about what LARP is now. And um, I have written some, <laughs> some uh, where, where on some of these slides there are notation on which game the picture is from. And I will sort of go into that on some slides and on some slides I won't. The, this is just some pointers to what I say what we need to have to have a LARP. I would say a LARP is a story in the White Road. The story was about <laughs> sort of an adaptation of a real world thing that is uh, a special hobo culture in Denmark where they travel with these carts on the streets. And we tell that story by playing it. We also need characters to, this, to a game. Uh, anyone spotting me here? <laughs> I'm the uh, Minister of Finance in this sort of steampunk uh, Victorian age uh, game called The City of Our Dreams. We need characters, as in a, as in a play. Um, there are exceptions to almost, almost everything I say. So we we need a location. This is uh, 
a post-apocalyptic game called Duskland, Skymningsland. And it was <laughs> set in a awesome like old quarry with a lake. And it was uh, really cool because it was <laughs> raining and muddy and shitty because we played this last scrap of villagers, uh, of sort of refugees from the, the big war in Sweden. And the rain and the environment just like... And it was, we, this was a variant of, we, we, we played sort of a fascist community where the people with guns really oppressed. And I think it was the most horrible game I've ever, ever, ever been in. I don't think I have cried so much in a game ever. It was extremely hard for some people. Because the experience is always different for everyone. And as I said, there are exceptions to this. A trend right now that I love is that we can use any environment to play a game. We can use sort of theater black box style. We don't need a quarry. We can do it in a classroom or in a theater black box. And we can play any scene in that. We just pretend as in a theater that now we're in this big house and now we're here. Uh, but that needs to be in the... Övrens in the... Social contract. Yeah, in the social contract with everyone. Now we're doing this. Now we're doing this. Yeah. So, what would you say that to play in a in a black box or a classroom or a, a you know kind of a, a office building or whatever? You you need you need you need more experienced players. No, I wouldn't no? say you need experienced players. I would say you get another experience. Okay. That's the only thing. Uh, we talk in the Nordic LARP culture. It's a lot about the three sixty degrees perspective. It's everything. What you see is what you get. Everything is real uh, that you see almost. <clears throat> and if we have a medieval tent village, sort of, not a tent village, but a camp. And everyone wears hands in clothes, and I can wake up, and I just see, like, the small butterfly landing on my hands in clothes. The illusion is fantastic, but I can also get a really strong experience using, like, the same kind of role-playing in a black box, during a game of five minutes or two hours, instead of a week or three days. As I said, we can use, uh, we use, when we use the 360 uh, perspective, costumes and props become really important. We need a dragon for this game. Okay, we need to build a dragon. If we want the dragon to actually be up here. And if we want the dragon to breathe fire, we need to build a dragon that breathes fire. And we have done that. And it was not perfect. But we did build a very big dragon. We were supposed to breathe fire. I don't remember if it did. Yeah, it did. It did, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, this is really important just from where the community has come from with all this fantasy and medieval uh, being a big part of the community. Like, Many, for, for many, many people, like 95% of when they're doing their LARPing hobby is sitting at home sewing their clothes. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's a, a part of like preparing for your game emotionally and maybe with your group, discussing, discussing that, yeah, our evil monks who worship this evil god, we will do this. Ah, can't we do this plot as well? While sitting and constructing, constructing your whole thing. So it, it becomes important, and for the t 360 like illusion, this can be really important as well. As in a black box, uh, or sort of compared to when you do this in a black box room, when I can play a woman, and that's no problem, we can play that we have some stuff here, and we don't have it. Because we can, actually, we can use our imagination, and we don't always need this stuff. But as, as we said, in the social contract, what kind of game do we want? And we will go from there. Some people like one thing more than another. I'm not sure what I like the most. I like sort of everything that is good. Key, key, key factor, participation. There is no audience. Of course, there are exceptions. Capo had an audience system, Denmark had some audience. Sometimes LARPs are filmed, then it becomes some sort of audience. But to create a magic circle, <coughs> I don't want... Uh, when I come in, if I come in here and I say, yeah, we're going to do a small, small classroom game, 
I don't want the real teachers to stand in the corner watching and say, oh, this was interesting. They need to be in it. Otherwise, we will have much more sort of embarrassing feelings and, I mean, to create, to make us comfortable with everything everyone is in. Everyone needs to be in it. And also, participation and participatory culture. We all share the, the work of art that we're doing. We all share this experience and we are all co-creators. And that's really, really, really important. And I think also that maybe this is maybe one of the things that makes me like this hobby so much. Because it's really beautiful that we are all sharing this. We are all creating it together. No one, maybe someone is owning it the more. Maybe there is an IP that someone actually owns, very common in the US. You sell your LARP campaign to franchise in another city. But we're still creating the stories together. And that's really, really important. So what is LARP? We improvise. It's improvised theater with a story. And sometimes, or I'd say most of the times, with characters. I've done games with sort of very fussy characters, when everyone maybe is sort of playing, in, everyone is inside someone's head for an hour. But with the usual thing is we have characters, and we use, we play, we improvise. People often say, but how does it work? If it's sort of like theater, don't, don't you have a script? No, we don't have a script. Generally, you can also have a script for some stuff. But we have a character that we can go back to. We have the setting, like in Hemligheten, which was an interpretation of uh, the movie The Village. Uh, with this isolated village, and someone who really knows maybe know that it's the, the real world outside is maybe not that dangerous, but it is maybe dangerous. Anyway, I'll tell the village, don't go outside the village. And maybe that is really good, because then <laughs> I only need to know about this village. I know who is, the, who is who and who is that, and I know my own character, and I especially know the people who I'm going to play with in my house, with my family. And based on that, Based on that, I can improvise freely. That's, my, that's the limits I need to have uh, for, my, for my imagination. But it's really important to, to know how much you need to know. And, yeah, a question? Yeah, that was my question. Yeah. Like, how much of preparation you do for your character in terms of research, for example. If the story takes place, like, 200 years ago, yeah. and you're playing so, a... Sort of yeah, if, if I, if, for some games, it's, it's the, maybe it is like required reading. You need to watch this movie and read this book. Most of the games don't have that kind of hard, uh, like most games are not based on historical events. Some are. Uh, it's quite popular now to base uh, LARPs on uh, classic themes like uh, play or a uh, genre, and then you can just like watch this that TV series. Finland has right now a really, really interesting Harry Potter scene. <laughs> watch the Harry Potter movies and read the books, then you know the universe. And then I can just say something about a certain magician, and you can directly pick up and continue on that story. And we can have a discussion about that. But it's really important, and it also is uh, back to the contract. Which, which sort of level do I, as an organizer, require from the players? Is it no level at all? Is it read and come? Uh, read nothing and come, and I will tell you what you need to know. Or is it we're going to do a we are we are going to do a historical LARP about the 1930s in Germany, and it's really important that you at least read this part of the history, and I will tell you what you need to read. Because we're going to discuss politics. But you always need to remember how important is that part. Is it okay if people more doesn't know so much about it? Because maybe it's not those facts that are important to discuss. But anyway, it's, it's, what's the base of what I can improvise from? 
uh, some people don't have a problem with this. They don't see, they don't have a problem at all with that they don't know so much and they just sort of improvise and they don't think I cannot do so much. It's not a big problem if I say something wrong. And some other players think that if I say anything wrong, people will get mad at me and I will destroy the whole game. And they most never will. That's not, that's not usually what happens. That's if someone says something really, really wrong, people just ignore it and then it was fine. Um, yeah, so, but uh, it's, it's actually, it's really under interesting to talk about and understand because some people don't think this is a problem at all and for some people it's really blocking them because they think they can't improvise if they don't know everything and they're really afraid to do something wrong. So, why do we do this? We do it because it's fun. But what is fun? <laughs> I think uh, I would like raise this question a lot of times. Like, what is, why do I do this? It's, as in life, I think, like gaining new experiences. And I like the fun experiences. I like the experiences when I do something I haven't done, I, or I'm just doing something that makes me happy. I mean, these kids on uh, this sort of a summer camp LARP thing that uh, an organization that I'm involved in called uh, Live Backstad and the LARP workshop do mm -hmm. as a sort of a summer event uh, outside Westeros on an island in Sweden. You can come there every day for three weeks during the weekdays and then you go home every night. And you can come and partake in this story, sort of different story each year, but you can come and continue with your character the next day. If this was happening when I was a kid, I would have gone because I knew that I like this. It is fun. But we don't only do this for fun. I don't only do this for fun. Some people say that you cannot do a game about this. This is, uh, this is political. This is, this is not fun. You're destroying the hobby. Why are you doing this? Annika talked briefly about the game called Capo. I asked her, like, was that the most, like, the hardest game you were, have been to the most harsh experience? What was it called? Capo. Capo. It's, a Capo. Capo. Okay. it's sort of, I think it's a word for, uh, it's sort of a mafia leader type of word, mm -hmm. like a mafia captain. I will, I, will, I will explain that, but Annika said, no, Capo was not the worst experience in a game, well not the worst, but the most horrible experience in a game, it was, that actually was and still I made my family a dinner, nice evening with the family. That's based on the fest and Yeah, based on the fest and play, play, which is like this horrible, horrible family, like family and rela related people event, a party, but it's very like very, very dark. That was her birth experience. But a lot of people, one of my, some of my closer friends in this community said that this game it was horrible. People for between, I think, 8 or if it was 48 or 24 hours. I don't remember if it was 2 days for most, but at least 24 hours. They went into a facility and were treated like prisoners on Guantanamo Bay. Not exactly, because the, the idea was how... a uh, messed up society turns people bad. Can we, can, we, can we try, can we experiment with this? Can we see if this actually happens? Sorry, just, just to clarify, when you say it was horrible, is, is that on a positive scale, so that it was so intense that people... Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, people can experience that this was not a good game, a bad game. I mean, the, my, my English is not, my English no, no, is not no, no, that fine tuned, but I understand I, your question. Right. So I, mean, I meant that a horrible experience in the sense that uh, maybe they, they felt really bad and they cried and it was intense. Was intense so, so, but so, in so a, from a gaming perspective, it was really good. Like it if was, you wanted that kind of game, they some of the players wanted that kind of game. Right. Absolutely. But your I understand your question is really valid. But so they, what they did was they they had guards, but the system that the prisoners were in didn't need guards. The guards just came in took someone out for interrogation. Because everyone in the system were so afraid to do anything wrong that they always picked on the smaller ones. 
they always the system was in control because everyone was doing horrible stuff to the persons, the newer ones, and broke them down to not be broken down themselves, to protect themselves. And horrible stories from this game, in a good way or in a bad way, I don't know. Uh, many people that I know, and myself included, I was interested in this game, I still am interested in this game. But I did not want to go there. I maybe I didn't think that this game was not for me. It's like you know, I don't know, a hole in my heart about your Gizmo design. Interesting film. I don't particularly enjoy the time I spend in the cinema with that film. Yeah. But interesting, nevertheless. I mean, not every film we watch is a rom com, is it? Yeah. We, but I mean, I'm. There, yeah. When you're in a in a game like that, because I this reminds me of the prisoners experiment. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And Stanford prison experience. It's yeah. really similar to that. But and of course, they stopped. looked at that. Yeah, but yeah. that had to be stopped because people was, were so involved that it, they crossed a line. Yeah. Is there, when you're in a game like that, is there a way like you can say, okay, hide, stop. This yeah. is too much for me. There is. Uh, there is safety words, and especially okay. important when you're doing a game this hard. Yeah. And uh, when you did interrogations. People had the system of uh, I can I can choose not to participate in this, and the guards would absolutely respect that because all the guards they were not players, they oh, were sort okay. of organizers um, when doing that stuff. Still, you when you're doing just an intense game, if we play a really intense scene, still in the community, it's a it's a right now a really good ongoing discussions of when we need to stop. And when I say the stop word, hasn't it always gone too far? Exactly. When I felt something really bad, shouldn't yeah. we have stopped before? Yeah. How do we do that? Yeah. Yeah. And it, I don't think that this is, this is really, I think this is similar. I'm not an actor, but I think it's really similar to how artists like do stuff and then they are become crazy in the head because they've done so, so much intense experiences. I mean, it's really good to do really strange and new experiences, but... I don't know to what extent you should actually feel bad. Well, there should be a sort of sense of safety. There is absolutely a sense of safety. Okay. Absolutely. I, w I would say there are organizers who don't think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but all the, like, all the good organizers, and, and absolutely in this game. Mm -hmm. still, there are bound still boundaries are being broken uh, between players. Uh, still, the safety words might not be used sometimes. Someone thinks that, no, I shouldn't stop because I don't want to destroy the scene. The best method right now to work to this, if you're doing a really strong experience, is to using workshops and to build up good methods. How to maybe see that you're going too far. A really good method is, uh, which worked in Duskland, which was this hard game for me, uh, that I was in the post-apocalyptic game, was just... If you, if you were going to play violence, you actually played, maybe you brawled for real. But I wouldn't uh, engage in a brawl unless I wanted to take that fight. Maybe you wouldn't like really, really hit each other hard. But if a person stronger than me comes up to me and wants to pick a fight, if I engage in that fight, that means I want to play along. Mm -hmm. And if I continue, then maybe he will, he will break me down. Not break me, but he will take me down. Uh, but if I don't want to fight, if I'm uncomfortable, I shouldn't engage. I should, uh, I should surrender or something like that, or play, play that situation in a way that works. But safety is really important, especially if we're talking about stronger stuff. Um, so we can come back to that discussion later. But I mean, this is always important, but it's not, it's not something we always need to focus on if we're not doing a really, really strong experience. If we're doing like this, uh, like this game on Life of Esther Holman, it shouldn't be like about people cry. Uh, people can cry because my, maybe no, my friend get caught by the demon. It's horrible, but it's not. It's not that intense uh, in that in that same way. And it's we wouldn't do capo with kids, of course. <laughs> I hope not. The one, the one you talked about before, the uh, the village. The village or yeah. But you said you you were crying. No, the Duskland. It was Duskland, yeah, yeah, the Schimmingsland. Yeah, Schimmingsland. That you were you went there and you cried. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lost a big part of the game. No, but not maybe a big part, but uh, yeah, but it was horrible. Yeah. 
but did you enjoy that class? Like, was that was that a pleasant? Was that fun, or was it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Afterwards, and also, I mean, yeah. But it, no, no, it's it. Uh, yeah. Okay. So my point in this is like fun. Why do we want to do this? People say people in in like in U.S. and in uh, in Germany. Maybe that they have very big games uh, that is mainly focused about winning battles, solving quests, which we have in Sweden, and that was where all the avant-garde scenes grew out from in the 90s. Winning, like more like traditional 80s role-playing style. Yeah, that's that's you, that is fun, and you can do that. But why do we watch a horrible movie or or uh, a play. What what is it that we want to live? Maybe maybe I get the rush out of having had a really intense experience. I mean, is going a, going a roller coaster ride is that fun? Is it fun to be scared for ten seconds? No, I know I'm safe. Some people might think it's fun. Sometimes sometimes it's just adrenaline, the kick, and that's really important. I I think like chasing kicks could be something. A clue here, maybe. Um, so I'm just going to now talk about uh, sort of three sort of areas where LARP has sort of poured out of just being LARP. And the first one is uh, sort of LARP goes to Hollywood. LARP goes to more the sort of an entertainment world where. Uh, the truth about Marika, something in Marika, is one production made by the company P, and the conspiracy for good here is another one. Uh, the truth about Marika, together with SVT, uh, the conspiracy for good was a production sponsored by Nokia, made by the company P, uh, with other production units involved as well. But its creator, a co-creator, was uh, Tim Kring, who wrote Heroes. So it was with kind of Hollywood fame you could do this production. And we used LARP in this production, which I was involved in this. And it was, uh, it was a game that started much like only like an ARG, but you could also interact with the story. They traveled through Europe, a small group of people, and you could go to Prague and meet them and help them, and you could help them online. But then it was like sort of like four Saturdays in London, which was sort of like a LARP. And physical event, you could go there, you could meet the characters that were in the story, you could help them, you could do, go kind of on a trailed quest, and uh, you could, they had a really cool technology called point and find, which is sort of like uh, QR code tagging with your mobile phone, but without the QR codes. Can you, you could tag a place, or a, and then I could recognize a place. And they also used lots of other different kind of edgy technology, uh, which most of it worked uh, after a real a lot of hard work. But but it it used uh, role playing. And what I saw, I was I played a character myself, uh, one of the bad guys, and I played a lot with. The actors who came in as sort of guards and stuff like that, who harassed the players, who they saw like maybe were running through the streets and finding trails and for finding clues and helping people, helping the main characters or evolving the story. And if you are a player and you come into London, and there's this guard in a suit who who has a cap with the logo of the evil company, and he like, who are you? Why are you? Why are you here? And you get engaged that quickly. And if you're doing anything, taking anything with you, and you're choosing your budget and doing something similar like this, actors, real human experience, it like increases the story so much, or increases the immersion or engagement, because, because then it becomes so much more real. The problem with this is that then you need probably salaries. <laughs> And it becomes really expensive. And it's not at all as scalable as internet uh, 
which if you not have a chat, you just have an internet that is more internet thing that you just can use. Internet works perfectly one to many. Like, just spread it out. But human interaction, not replaceable. It's, it, that's one of the things that I, like, I learned most from this game. Also, uh, here technology actually worked. Most pervasive games that you use technology, combined with technology, think twice, then think again if you think you want to use technology. Because generally, it always breaks down. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I was in the truth about Marika when we did experimental QR coding with crappy JavaScript uh, cell phone app thing. <laughs> Oh, it's dark and raining when I want to go out on a cool mission. Good luck. Taking photos when it's dark and raining doesn't work. Try like try when it's QR codes in the subway. If it's not well lit, it usually doesn't work. And that's just QR codes. You're like, no, there's no GPS coverage here. Everyone is using the 3G when you when, when everybody's commuting, the 3G doesn't work in Stockholm. Not even in the like internet capital of the world. It doesn't work then people cannot play if you're using the internet. So you always need to, if you're using technology, you definitely need to test. But this is, uh, this is a lesson which I've seen like so many times. And it's, yeah, especially if you're doing an experimental project. Like, if you're using technology, have a backup. If you're using technology, think like how much you really need to have. And keep it at a low level, at least at first. Okay, so uh, moving into another field is uh, LARP and ARP. And my example here is a game called Double Five, which I think has been organized two times in US and once in England. Maybe once on different occasions, but it's some, something like that. It was organized by a Danish guy called Bjarke Pedersen and an uh, American artist called Brady Condon. There is an international sort of Nordic LARP conference that is called Knutpunkt, Knudepunkt, or Knutpunkt, or Solmogokta, four names for the four countries, but the Knutpunkt conference. That American artist, I think he heard about LARP, he went there, he met all these crazy people, and then sort of this kind of events has started to be produced by him. There are other people in the field, uh, like a Finnish artist called Johanna MacDonald and her colleague Arne Korpela doing stuff in Finland. And stuff like popping up everywhere. Called LARPs. Or called, called LARP experiences. Because pr the performance scene, it's extremely close to this. Sometimes. And maybe very different sometimes. So it's, it's not like LARP is this, performance is this, theater is this. It's, it's very blurry. But anyways, LARP and art. What did uh, what did they do with level five? They uh, sort of organized. They they, they set up uh, at a, a gallery. They set up this game, and people knew it is a game, and they attend. I think they might be attending workshops as well. But they signed up. They knew it. Know it is a game, and the game is about uh, sort of self realization courses. That was very popular in, I think, the 70s, 80s. I don't remember the name, but it was a thing that people could relate to. And they played uh, a sort of that kind of course. And very double, because you, of course, live things, both your character, experience things, and your, 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 you, you experience things when you were in this game. So, a really cool thing that... Uh, uh, Brody has said why he uses LARP, and I, this is not an actual quote, but sort of that he sees when he does his performance thing, because he also films his games, which is not very traditional in LARP. You, some LARPs do, do very good documentation and filming, others it's sort of forbidden. <laughs> so um, he sees LARP as a way of uh, using a chance generator. Like to put in content, to create content in his performances. Like LARP is a really good way, getting people to improvise. So that was a really, I think that's a really cool view on LARP and how to put in role play into something. Like I can use this element 
to create stuff. And then, as I mentioned before, I work uh, partly at the LARP workshop in Livewerkstaden, uh, which is based in Westeros, but we do things all over Sweden. And this is uh, LARP and role playing uh, taking a way into education. Role playing in education has been around for ages, and like simulations, like I mean, a firefighter goes out and, oh, no, you need to get into the house and rescue this doll. <laughs> Maybe not LARP, but it's close. And you can get even closer to that by police education and, uh, and military education, where you have people dressing up and you do all these kind, kinds of things for training. But usually you don't have another uh, uh, character than yourself. So we really want to try to use LARP as a method. Because one thing that happens is we can completely change who we are in the LARP. We can change, we can work around. If there's like a classroom with very straight and very like the hierarchies in the classroom are very fixed. Like the cool kids, the quiet kids, and so forth. By changing the roles of what happens? People suddenly, who are the quiet ones, can think that, no, I need to save the elf queen. I need to say this to everyone because I have found out the solution. And because we have turned around everything, people can like, find that they can express themselves in a completely other way than they think is the only fixed reality. Because what we do is we create other kinds, other worlds, other realities, other ways to... Yeah, we create new realities. So, using it in education is also very powerful because you, you live in another story. You could say, like, walk a mile in someone else's shoes or feet, or how the expression goes. If I have played a person seeking asylum in Sweden by getting forms in a completely ununderstandable language, by interacting with people, maybe talking Russian, only and they cannot understand me. And I do this for a short while or a long while, but it's, at least I get some sort of experience of something else, and which, which can create like, really, really strong memories in my body. It doesn't say that I know exactly how it is to be like getting, trying to get asylum in Sweden, but maybe I've gone at least a bit closer to that, to gaining a bit more empathy towards that situation. Or it could just be used to make education more fun. It's fun to play. Okay, we play. And we put in... Let's uh, learn about the workings of the French Revolution. How, what did certain groups think? And what was the sort of the bigger lines in the, that history? If we read about that, and then we play it out. I'm one of the groups, and I'm one of the other groups, my friend here. And... We sort of, we can learn about that. We don't need to learn all the dates and the years, but have been in that situation. Maybe I realized that, okay, but maybe these people who, who did all these executions, maybe they were afraid, or maybe they, they did it because of this reason. So we can use it, yeah, for, yeah, we can use it. Now I didn't say about factual information. You could put in factual information as well. But we do it more fun. Maybe I need to wrote, write a letter to the queen in perfect grammar, in English if I'm a Swedish student, like the, to the Queen of England, then it's important to, to write the ex exactly correct, and I want to do it, like, uh, and then, it's, then it, that is gamistic. That's just me wanting to, to win, to get to, to do a good game. Uh, but we put it in this environment, because it maybe becomes more fun. And in education, how do you get everyone to participate and do a really strange activity. That's not easy. That's quite hard. But some people love it. And some people don't like it as much. As well as in any class. But they're like sort of have doing this for a couple of years. We know that it sort of works. And also gaining a lot of experience about how to do it. Uh, this picture is from a game called Snapone. Snapone is a reference to like 
I think it's in the 1700s or 1600s in Sweden, there was a, there was quite a big guerrilla movement towards uh, uh, the hard, the, the king's kind of bad rule in those regions, like the high taxes. Uh, so we put that name to a game that is set in an alternate reality Sweden, where uh, we have uh, guerrilla forces uh, fighting against the army. Um, so sort of a guerrilla movement in Sweden. And the, the game was done that it was several parallel games doing, telling different parts of the story. Uh, and what, what it really was about, this game, was about moral sh morals and moral choices. Like, reality is not black and white. It's really not right and wrong. It's only like different shades of grey. So, for example, Anna Karin is now pointing out, you, you are the traitor in this group. Yeah, probably that person is the traitor of this guerrilla movement and we should leave him out. We should uh, take this person and kill him or throw him out or whatever. Should we, should we kill that person? Should we, should we leave him out? Should we, what should we do? What, what is right and what is wrong? There's so many questions when, when discussing morals that you can pick up. And it's, it, I wouldn't say like, I cannot say like how much you learn, but you get into that experience. And like, you're only for my LARPing, which has been mainly for fun. Of course, I've seen so many different things that have, have had impact on me. So, I will absolutely happy to answer some more questions, but I want to give you some pointers to, uh, to uh, more knowledge about this. So, there are two things. I just want to show you this picture as well. <laughs> it's, it's actually from the Vive la Revolution French uh, Revolution LARP, and it's this uh, beautiful nuns who actually are smuggling refugees. But who could tell? They're just nuns. Uh, so, uh, the Nordic LARP book, really, really good. It's, in, it's available to buy both online and at SF Book Handel. There's like any documentation, documentation on LARP that you should get if you think this is interesting at all. Get it before it disappears. Uh, it's it's uh, 300 kroners, Swedish crowns, and it's that is like highly made that price is highly made available through a lot of fundings and stuff like that so get that book because it really sums up this hobby in a really really good way the other thing i want to mention is playground magazine i cannot promise how it will turn out after this year but the old uh, copies are uh, available uh, there are some stuff posted online and hopefully this year there will be more stuff uh, published online, but it's a way into seeing international games and also games connected to role-playing like some strange movie connected to LARP or performance and stuff like that There is uh, another thing which I actually am sort of biased, but uh, it's uh, one of the things I have producing and it's called Nordic LARP Talks and we thought uh, two years ago that there's so much good knowledge in this community and people speak about it and we go to the Knutepunkt conference we listen and it's fantastic and they explain things really really good and then I google LARP and I get videos and I see this video of the guy screaming lightning bolt if you have seen that that's a great video yeah uh, shows how American LARP at least used to be it's only about fighting almost everything you'll see. Uh, and it's only fa fantasy games, which I, I think now, I told you, it's absolutely not this always fantasy. In all countries, I think, we have different genres. So Nordic Lord Talks is uh, kind of TED Talk style speeches about different uh, games or different methods that are used, or like uh, talking about different subjects on LARP and a quite understandable way if you're not a LARPer, but really, really good speakers. Uh, and I will put this presentation and I will put all links to all of this on my blog. 
and I think I can send it to you as well, so you just can put it out. But um, like, if you think like some of this stuff can be interesting, just go on, go in and check out a few videos. Uh, I also want to tell you to go to uh, the Knutepunkt conference if you like. You want to at least like work a bit more with role playing or participation. The Knutepunkt conference is uh, yearly in the early spring or spring, and it's uh, this year in Finland. And because it's in Finland, it's called Solmukorta. Uh, and all of this knutpunkt, it means sort of nodal point, like a key point. Um, and what it is, it's a conference, it's about two or three hundred people from the Nordic countries, but also all, all parts of the world, actually, coming, because the Nordic scene is the most vibrant in these more avant-garde forms. And... Um, it's uh, speeches, it's conferences. If you would come, I'm sure you could hold a program item of your own and tell about have you maybe involved some of this stuff in what you do. Um, it's, a, it's so much about sharing and like getting the community together. And, and that conference was, I think it's 97, the first year, and that has a, played a big part in why the whole Nordic community has grown uh, like with really rapid speed compared to the other parts of the world. Because it happened in, by some reasons, people started to meet in the Nordic country and saying, oh, okay, you're also doing LARP. Okay, you're also doing LARP. And then a few years later, people met up, had this first conference, and then it started with people saying, oh, you're doing this in this way. Oh, we're doing it in a different way. And people sort of looked what pe each country did different, which still are, it's still debates on how you should do things and differences in the whole community. But by looking at the differences, we saw that what we shared in common. And we met up and we did fantastic games together. And also, uh, maybe not the first year, but at least the years after and still, there's a book with articles, most of, many of them online, uh, that you can download or you can buy these uh, Knutepunkt books which has really, really good articles. As I said, many are available as PDFs, but those articles are also a key thing. Uh, the, both the conference and the, and the texts to like, have shared the knowledge about really cool things and interesting topics. Uh, so that conference is, has played a big role. Uh, go there if you, <laughs> if you want to learn more. So this is me. Uh, this is my email and I'm quite an uh, eager Twitterer. Tweet me up. Uh, check out Livexstaden for uh, pedagogical LARPs. Uh, as I said, I don't work there as much, but I would like, I can absolutely connect you. We can do a project together if you want to. And the other co workers there can, we, we, I can connect you to them. Uh, my production, video co production company is called FKDV. SE. And as I said, we work mainly with online video, live streaming, and mobile video. And you can check that out as well. I think that's mainly in Swedish. Um, yes, that's sort of it. I don't know how tired you are. Uh, if you want to, questions now or later, at least, uh, thanks a lot.